put everything other than start and end it. And yeah, it, you just started it. Okay. Okay. So um, if you guys want, you guys can go ahead and start. One second. Yeah, go ahead, judges. All right, I'll be introducing us. So uh, first, let's just go through our team. Um, Amol, I'll be presenting banking money management. I'll be introducing us today. Anyone else wants to introduce themselves? Yeah, my name is Tejas, and I'm going to talk about fintech uh, toward the latter stages of this presentation. Uh, my name is Grim, and I'll be going over the compounding and interest. Uh, my name is Josh, and I'll be going over the. All right, Josh, we, we can't hear Josh. Yeah. I think you're on mute too, or not? Is better now? Yeah, yeah, that's better. Okay. All right. Arno, I All right. think you need to introduce yourself. Arno, yeah, I think you need Yeah. Uh, my name is Arno, and I'm doing future planning. All right, so let's get started. Go ahead, Emil. All right, so. Firstly, I just want to thank you all for coming to this workshop today. By coming, you guys have taken the first step to reaching your own financial literacy. And so before we actually get into the workshop, I just want to give a little bit of background of what Flio actually is. So you can see it stands for Financial Literacy Education Organization. And today, 66% of Americans are financially illiterate and don't have the critical skills, which puts them at more of a risk for pervasive problems such as homelessness, poverty, and much more. As a matter of fact, a lack of basic financial understanding is a bigger cause of homelessness than the amount of income that they actually make. Simply put, it's not just how much you make, but moreover, how you manage the money that you make. And so we started this initiative when we learned that these essential concepts were not being taught in schools as much as they should be. This realization prompted us to spend a year researching and building a platform that would provide any student with the opportunity to become financially literate. We acknowledge that this lesson will cover all the bases. Therefore, at the end, we'll also provide additional resources so you can further your learning and become financially conscious on your own. So without further ado, we're gonna start with a seemingly basic topic. And while this might seem more like a formality, you will see, you'll soon see how it is intertwined with various facets of personal finance. So let's take it away, Graham. Compounding is an integral part of business and finance, which is both important to be economically self-sufficient. Uh, now remember that compounding can work for you and against you. So let's start off by understanding what compounding is. By definition, it's the process in which an asset's earning from either capital gains or interest are reinvested to generate additional earnings over time. Therefore, it is instructed, constructed with the interest rate in mind. Now, it's also important to understand the difference between simple interest and compound interest. Simple interest only calculates your money from the original value, whereas compound interest calculates your money based on your most recent value. So in easier words, simple interest only generates a specific value based on your original amount and the fixed interest rate, whereas compound interest adds an amount based on your most recently compounded value. So it puts an interest on top of a previous interest. An example of this is the math variable E, commonly seen in exponential graphs, which therefore allows you to increase your profits over time at a fast rate. Uh, now you'd be wondering how is this related to your everyday lives? Well, there are many applications. Uh, for example, compound interest is a benefit of depositor who wants to deposit money into a bank, or commonly used for credit cards and student loans. Uh, all of which are able to increase your profits over time. So let's look at how we're going to calculate compound interest. Uh, we use this formula, which is very commonly seen, where A is the final amount, or the amount you receive after compounding over a certain amount of time. P is the starting amount, or also known as the principal amount. R is your interest rate, uh, which is usually expressed as a percentage, but when put into the equation, it's a decimal. N is the number of times the amount is compounded yearly. So this could mean if you have 12 months, it would be compounded 12 times, where N would be 12. For quarterly, it would be four. For semi-annually, it would be two. And if 
it not mentioned at all, it's commonly one for annually. And lastly, T is the number of years you want the amount to be compounded. With this equation, you can calculate the different aspects of your compounding plan by just solving for a variable. Although compounding may seem very beneficial for making profits, there are many downsides to it as well. A quote by Albert Einstein sums up the idea perfectly. Compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it, he who doesn't pays it. So just like how your profits can go very fast, credit card debt and other loans can go rapidly as well. Credit card debt, if not paid off immediately, could skyrocket just like your profits. With one mistake, you could be swimming in a pool of debt. But one way to avoid this is to make sure you pay off all your debt on time so that you can avoid debt accumulation, uh, especially from compound interest. So let's just look at a practice problem to give you better sense. If $3,000 is placed in an account with an interest rate of 5% and is compounded quarterly, how much is the account at the end of five years? So looking at this equation, let's solve for variables. P is our principal amount, which is given as $3,000. Uh, we have an interest rate of 5%, but we have to put it as a decimal, so it's 0 0.05. It mentions it's compounded quarterly, so that means N would be four, and T would be five for five years. If we put this all into the equation, we can see that A, or the amount we receive after, is $3,846.11. So over that five years, with an interest rate of 5%, you made a gain of $846.11. Uh, let's look at another problem. It, suppose you have a loan that is compounded at an interest rate of 6.9% over 10 years. After the 10 years, you own an amount of $100,000. Now, how much did you originally put into the loan? Uh, keep in mind that at this point, they don't give us P. So that is the one equation that is not, or one variable that's not known. After the 10 years, we receive $100,000. So A is $100,000. Our interest rate is 6.9%. So it's a decimal 0 0.069. It does not mention how many times it's compounded. So we can automatically assume uh, N is equal to one and T would be 10 for 10 years. Looking at the equation, you can see that P would be $51,312.47. Now, if you look closely at that number, you can see you started off with 51K and you ended up with $100,000. So you owe almost double the original amount. Compounding is an important part of being economically stable. And if you can compound successfully, it will make it much easier for you to manage your money. Uh, let's go ahead and look at banking and money management. Uh, that would help. Uh, thank you. If you want to mute him, oh yeah, okay. I did. All right. So as you guys may know, this is the banking and money management section. Next slide, please. So what is the goal of this section? The goals of this part is to enable viewers and students to create a plan using the tools that provide in order to save up money and allocate it for future uses. But ultimately, the main goal of this lesson is to teach viewers and students to become financially literate and responsible. All right, next slide. So what is money management? When you search up the definition of money management on Google, you get money management is a process of expense tracking, investing, budgeting, banking, and evaluating taxes of one's money, which is also called investment management. Money management is a strategic technique used to make money yield a higher interest output value for any amount spent. So as high school students and young adults without much prior financial knowledge, this may be a bit hard to understand and fully comp comprehend the meaning of. So we go to the next slide, please. The true definition of money management is the control of cash flow. So this means if you can control whatever you're spending and whatever's coming in to your bank account, you can become financially smart and make financially smart decisions. You can also refer to it more narrowly as investment management and portfolio management. And learning to utilize this properly will help you avoid a lot of financial problems like wrong investment or credit decisions, and will help you reach your financial goals. More importantly, it helps you avoid incurring too much debt. All right, next slide, please. So why am I stressing it so much now? Scientists estimates that 42% of recent pandemic-induced layoffs will result in permanent job loss, meaning that they won't be able to return to the jobs that they previously had. 
And the overall unemployment rate shot to 14.7% in April, which is a while ago if you think about it. And these are the worst figures on record since monthly jobless statistics began to be compiled in 1948. With the second wave coming around, we can only expect these figures to worsen. This means that people will be losing their steady source of income that they heavy, heavily relied on and will be forced to make financially educate, educated decisions or risk heading into poverty. All right, next slide. So first, let me talk about balance sheets. Balance sheets are a tool used much more often in the corporate scene, but also can be used to track family expenses. It's a much more complicated tracker and can be used to calculate equity, liabilities, and assets, as you can see. And also it tracks the overall net profit and net worth of a person, meaning how much they're making yearly minus expenses and how much they actually are worth without the debt included. All right, next slide. On the other hand, a budgeting plan is a much less cluttered and a simple, more straightforward tracker. This can be used by young adults in their day-to-day -day lives in order to track smaller purchases, such as food, clothing, gas, etc. It's a great tool that enables you to plan for future expenses and allocate your money for each category ahead of time. If you guys want a sample tracker you can use, you guys can go ahead and email us at the end or just contact us in the chat and I can send you one afterwards if you guys are time using it. All right, next slide, please. So I'm going to be talking about credit and debit, and these are two major terms you'll see thrown around often when using balance sheets. And this isn't referring to debit and credit cards. It's actually referring to how much you're going to be making an income of and how much you're going to be spending. So debit is normally on the left-hand side of charts. It represents an income or increase of wealth in an account. So an example is selling a chair for $35. You'll be debiting $35 because you're making $35. And credit on the, is on the right-hand side of charts. It represents spending or a decrease of wealth within an account. So buying groceries, you're spending $35 and you're buying an item. At the bottom of the presentation, you can see I have an example. Debit on the left-hand side with a plus sign, meaning that it's an income. Credit on the right-hand side with a minus, you're spending money. And you can see if you have 100 for debit and 50 for credit, anyone know how much is in your account? You just put it in chat you like. All right, well, let's see if anyone wants to answer, but it's 50 in your account because you subtract the 50 from credit and you'll have 50 overall. So the next slide, please. So now we're talking about debits and credit cards. You guys have probably heard about these before, but they're very different from debit and credit when using balance sheets. Debit cards use money directly from your bank account and use an interchange fee like credit cards. Interchange fees are transaction fees that allow the bank to make money off your spending. Debit cards are cheaper as so you don't have to pay back money that has been increased due to the rate provided by the bank. You also don't even have to worry about paying the money back as it only allows you to spend what is within your account already. Credit cards, on the other hand, are similar to taking a loan from the bank and then paying it off in the future with an interest added on to how much you uh, loan from the bank. And they allow you to have access to the bank's vast supply of wealth, but you have to repay the money with an interest rate, as I mentioned. And credit cards allow you to build your credit score for the future. So if you guys want to start now and you think you can build your credit score, it's a great idea because you can take bigger loans for houses, college, whatever it may be that you need in the future. If you have any questions, you can unmute your mic or just put it in the chat. We'd be happy to answer them. Don't think anyone has anything, so we can move on to the next section, which is investing. All right, so when we're talking about finance, investment is one of the most important topics. But however, investment can also is probably one of the hardest ones to understand as well. So how does investment work and what is it? So first of all, investment is defined as the act of allocating resources, usually money, with an expectation of generating a profit or income. So there are many different forms of investing, from investing into the economy through, stock, through the stock market, or you can invest into particular companies through loans. But as of right now, what matters to us high school students is mostly investing into the economy, which is often purchased uh, with bonds and stocks or uh, through various funds. A bond is a certificate issued by the government 
or a public company promising to repay borrowed money at a fixed rate. And a stock is a security that represents the ownership of a fraction of a corporation. Uh, those two definitions may seem a bit confusing, but those two uh, uh, words are grossly very different concepts. So make sure not to mix them up. So if it helps, uh, you can think of uh, the words like this. A bond is a loan that you give to a company that they have to pay you back later with an interest rate. And a stock, uh, when you own a stock, that means that you own a percentage of that organization. So other than those two concepts, there are also something called mutual funds, which are professionally managed investment funds that pools money from many investors to purchase securities. Uh, these securities vary depending on the type of fund. Mutual funds can be invested in stocks, bonds, cash, or other commodities. And some funds cover multiple categories in order to be more balanced. Next slide. Um, here's a diagram of some of the various mutual funds. Uh, even this diagram doesn't cover everything. So I'm sure you'll, under, you'll know how complicated investment is. So some of the notable categories that you might want to remember are index funds, target date funds, and exchange traded funds. So index funds are portfolios traded to uh, imitate a financial market index, such as the S&P 500. They contain stocks from all of the companies in the, index, uh, in the market index in order to mirror the performance of the economy as a whole. Uh, target date funds are funds that rebalance asset classes and over time so that it becomes heavier to stocks when you're younger and heavier to bonds as you age. So both of these um, uh, funds are very, very useful when you start talking about your own retirement. And then on the other hand, there's exchange traded funds, which are like mutual funds, uh, a collection of securities such as stocks. Uh, but the thing is exchange traded funds are different from mutual funds in that Exchange traded funds are listed on stock market uh, stock exchanges uh, throughout the day, unlike mutual funds, which are only uh, put up once at the market closure. Next slide. So when you invest, you will also want to know how safe an investment is. As a rule of thumb, here's a diagram of safety levels of various forms of investment. So as you can see, individual stocks tend to be the most ri riskiest ones but they also have the highest percent uh, potential for the greatest reward. On the other hand, uh, investments into some, uh, stuff like saving accounts are the safest, safest but they have uh, a very, very uh, low potential of reward. So what you decide to uh, invest in is your own personal choice and how willing you are to risk your own money. So um, that what you invest in is a decision you have to make for yourself. Next slide. Now, if you choose to invest in anything, you one thing one thing that's very important to understand is um, how to read uh, a stock's history. So right here we have a picture of Apple stock stock chart for the past five years. The letters on the top left uh, indicate uh, are is the stock ticker, and it indicates the uh, company. Uh, in this case, Apple is represented by AAPL. Uh, the white number on the top left, uh, top right, I mean, is the current price of each stock, which is pictured to be $318.19. And the right number right next to it, uh, the red number right next to it is how how much the number has ch uh, changed since the last market co closure. So um, uh, in this application, the red means that the stock has dropped a certain amount, while a green number means that it has been that amount. So the green line on the chart is called what we call the trend line. It marks the price of each stock at each point in time. If you can see, Apple's uh, trend line has generally had an upward trend. So for Apple, that is a really, really good thing. So one thing to be careful about though, when looking at the trend line is to, you gotta understand what uh, the time range is you're looking at. A single day, week or even month is often not enough to tell how a company has been performing. Um, as you can see right here, uh, we are looking at Apple through a five year span, which gives, which gives us a way better understanding of how Apple's stock has been doing. In addition to that, don't worry too much about uh, fluctuations in the um, 
uh, trend line as well. So many factors can affect the stock changes, such as changes in leadership, releases of new products, political events, and more. And one example of uh, something uh, that's affected stocks, like in current events, is the COVID-19 pandemic, which has greatly dictated the course of the market over the past few months. And if you can uh, try to see why the prices have changed as such, and if you can understand uh, how, uh, why the prices have changed, you'll be able to po uh, predict possible future changes to it as well. Next slide. So on this slide, there's a picture of Tesla stock over the past five years. Uh, go ahead and give it a quick glance. Uh, try to understand its changes. What's its general trend? Can you think of any uh, reasons why its stock price behaved as such? Go ahead and put it in the chat if you guys know the answer. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, that that's shown the big spike at uh, 2020. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I guess we'll move on. Next slide. So now this part is more per uh, personally. Uh, closer to you. So why should you invest? And why do you feel why should you feel a need to invest into the economy? Well, there's, all, there's almost certainly a method uh, out there that suits you, your personal style when you invest. Uh, people often, often have a misconception on investment, that investment is for the rich elites with vast amounts of money, like Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos. But that's really untrue. Investment is actually a really flexible thing that anyone who wants to get involved in can can do it, no matter how much wealth you have. So investment doesn't have to be a risky business if you don't want it to be. It's a good way. Investment is also a good way to get involved in the economy. The economy relies on investment and transactions in order to stay strong. By by investing, you are also contributing the stability of the growing economy economy and by investing you can also get uh, personally involved in industries that matter to you um, your investments can shape the fu uh, future in addition investing early can provide long-term benefits planning for the future can uh, greatly impact by your, uh, your investment decisions made early on okay so now let's talk about uh, future planning specifically paying for college. Uh, let's talk about college, which for many of us is in the near future. As many as 44.7 million Americans have student loan debt, according to a 2018 report by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. This means that roughly one in every six people over the age of 18 have student loan debt. Not only that, but more than $1.5 trillion in debt is owed. Let's go more in depth on what student loans are. Student loans are loans taken by students who are not able to pay for college completely. Like we've already talk, talked about, about loans, since we'll have to pay it back with an interest. This means you'll end up paying the bank more money than you took from them. And with interest rates being 6% or higher, it's important not to take out more money than is necessary. So what are some ways that you could lower the overall cost of going to college? One of the easiest ways to reduce the cost of going to college is through scholarships. Scholarships are financial aid awards designed to help reduce the, the cost students have to pay for an undergraduate degree. Every year, $46 billion in scholarships are given out, which means almost everybody can at least save some money while we're going to college. Not only that, but there are multiple ways to get them. There are seven common scholarships granted by both organizations and colleges. Scholarships can be granted through academic achievement, community service, athletic achievement, hobbies and traits, personal background, financial need, and family workplace or military affiliation. These scholarships are not only awarded by just the college, but some programs do as well. Organizations can give out scholarships in a number of ways. It can be granted to winning a competition or through personal achievements. One example of this can be Coca-Cola, who has given out over $66 million to help out students pay for college. 
It's also important to remain frugal while in college. This can be achieved by cutting spending from simple tasks such as commuting from place to place to more advanced tasks like creating your housing plan for the entire school. It is always great to look for discounts when you shop and buy old and used textbooks off of former students. By doing these simple things, you can prevent yourself from being trapped under a lengthy and expensive loan. Now let's look at life after college. Next slide, please. Although retirement is a long way away, it never hurts to start learning about it now. The most common type of retirement plan is a 401k. A 401k is a plan that is normally offered to you by the company you work for. Its goal is to set aside money for retirement, and this money comes directly from your paycheck and into the 401k account. So you may ask, why is a 401k so important? Well, it's important because it helps you save money for retirement and also provides you with benefits along the way. For example, some companies may offer an incentive, such as for every dollar you put into your 401k, the company will match it with 25 cents. Another benefit is tax reduction. If you put money into your 401k, then the IRA will grant you a tax deduction on your adjusted gross income at the end of the year. I just used a lot of big words, so let's just take an example of this. Let's say you made $100,000 this year, and you put $20,000 of those dollars into your 401k account. At the end of the year, you will only be taxed as if you earned $80,000 that year. Another bonus about a 401k is that you could use money to uh, invest in the stock market or in bonds. By investing into, stock market, into the stock market and into bonds, you can get up to an 8% return annually on the amount you put into your 401k account. A 401k is a type of long-term savings which leads you to have a constant source of income. And remember, investing is not only about investing in the market, but is also about investing in the future. All right, so we kind of went over um, four main concepts of personal finance. So let's talk about an emerging industry um, in today's economy, which is fintech. It's one of the fastest growing industries. So let's get into it. So as the name suggests, fintech is finance plus technology. Um, so a lot of people here given that we're at a hackathon. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of a lot of you interested in technology. And if you're interested in finance or, or found any of the stuff we just went over appealing, this is a great um, opportunity of an industry you should get involved in. Next slide, please. So a lot of people throw around the word fintech, uh, but let's kind of get into what it exactly means. Uh, so firstly, fintech is the, the automation of financial services. So maybe back in the day, if we had wanted to deposit a check or deposit some money in a bank account, what we what we would do is we'd go go to the bank, meet the bank teller and give them give them the check or give them a hundred dollars, say, hey, can you deposit this in my account? Or say um we have Joshua here and I want to give Josh twenty dollars because I own twenty dollars. What I would do is I would meet him and then give him a twenty dollar note. But today, if I had to pay back Josh, I would just have to take my phone, um, and I I would text him. I would text him and say, "Hey, Josh." I mean, when I say text him, I mean I would Apple Pay him or Venmo him, and I have that ability because of fintech applications. And same thing with the bank example. Um, so examples of um fintech or online banking. Um, so Control Tower by Wells Fargo, Bank of America mobile app. They're all great examples of online banking where you can do all processes that you would have to go into a bank and actually do in real life you would you would do that you would do that in person um next is payment services something like apple pay venmo like i just like i just mentioned is a great way um is a great example of fintech because it's something we use on a daily basis the third is cryptocurrency which is not always which is not always used um by everybody but you might have heard of it uh, we have the bitcoin logo right here on the side and cryptocurrency is essentially a, a decentralized currency uh, that's digitized. So you can think of the US dollar that's um, backed by cash notes printed by the government. Cryptocurrency doesn't have one corporation, one entity, or one government controlling it. It's a decentralized, it's a de decentralized currency, meaning that no one can manipulate it. So a lot of people view that as safer. And lastly, crowdfunding platforms. I'm sure um, given that majority of us are high school students and we've undergone a lot of nonprofit ventures We've definitely heard of GoFundMe and other crowdfunding platforms where instead of going door to door and asking people, hey, can you give me $20 um, for this initiative I'm trying to take part in, uh, we can actually just set up something on the web on a website like GoFundMe, describe it, and people can pay right through GoFundMe as an app, and that will come straight to your bank account. 
So that's um that's that's an, an, another example of fintech. Uh, next slide, please. So why is fintech important? Um, one, it's part of our daily lives. So even if you're um even if you're not interested in uh thinking of doing anything entrepreneurial or enterprising in this industry, it's important to understand it because uh, it affects a lot of the things we do on a daily basis. Um, so to be safe, uh, fintech has a lot of security concerns because it's moving your money online. It's best to understand the concept as a whole um, because it affects us in so many ways. Uh, secondly, it's one of the fastest growing industries. Like I mentioned, um, the per capita of the industry is growing at uh, growing faster than any other industry right now. And this rapid growth, um, like rapid growth, growth in anything, allows for a lot of new opportunities. Um, so, like I said, it's a lot. It's a great. It's a great space for entrepreneurs um, or people who are interested in technology to break into this new sphere. Um, so, next slide, please. So, I kind of, I kind of want to talk about an application um, of fintech. Um, and given that we're at a hackathon, I wanted to pick an example that would really embody the intersection of finance and technology. So, for 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 this, this for this presentation, we've picked algorithmic trading. Um, and some of you might have heard of it. Some of you might have not heard of it. But as the name suggests, next slide, please. So algorithmic trading is uh, the use of code to execute investment strategies. So an algo, an algorithm, um, is something that. Oh, oh, do we have a question in the chat? Oh yeah, if you if you don't mind, we'll we'll address that in the end, definitely. Uh, we just get through this and we'll talk about it. Thanks. Oh yeah, so so algo trading is um the use of code to execute investment strategies. So typically in a hackathon, when we think of an application or a website, we think of how are we gonna write code to execute um our website or our program, right? Well, what we're trying to achieve. In algo trading, you're basically using that same code, those same principles to execute investment strategies. Um so like Josh talked about. Investment is putting money into a stock, bond, et cetera. Um, so you're using code to make those decisions. Um, and a key part of algorithmic trading is the MA or a moving average. And a moving average is a statistical tool that is essentially a smooth indicator of stock trend based on past data points. So if you look at this diagram on the right, um, that shows, excuse me, that shows the the stock, the stock trend of GE General Electric stock um in, in the part in, in the past whatever number of days. But you can see that naturally, like a stock, because the market is extremely reactionary, um, it's, it fluctuates a lot. But under it, you see kind of a smooth line, um, and that's the moving average. Um, and what that really does is um, a lot of people don't see um, the value in it. But what, what the moving average actually does, it allows us to understand the trend of GE uh, without having to account for all these fluctuations. Because I'm sure as coders, you guys would know that when you're writing code, uh, if if there's a lot of fluctuation in your data, it's harder to come up with a threshold or um, or conditional statements like if statements. Whereas if it's if it's a smooth line uh, like it is here, it's easier to keep the, to preserve the trend. So you're still uh, working off the data you've been given, but it makes it easier to write code around it. So and if the amount of days is smaller, then the moving average is more sensitive. So if it's 20 days, you'll see greater fluctuations in the moving average itself. Whereas if it's an over over span of about 200 days, the moving average would be less sensitive to the daily ups and downs of the market. And an example looks like it's been cut off here, but it says if the if the 20 day moving average moves up by X amount of points, then buy 50 shares. Um. So as programmers, um, I program, and the first thing uh, when 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 I see this, I think the if and then is uh, like a traditional body of code, right? You have an if statement, you have a conditional. So here. If it surpasses uh, X amount of points and the moving average is the input, then the body of code would execute the buy order for 50 shares of whatever stock. So that's kind of a way you can see uh, algorithmic trading in a very basic example. And we'll talk uh, in a couple slides, we'll talk about more specific algorithmic trading strategies. Oh, next slide, please. So let's talk about some benefits of algorithmic trading. Uh, and this is as opposed to manual or discretionary trading, which is which is essentially kind of what Josh was alluding to earlier when he talked about um, you as a person, you've seen something, you've seen something in the news or you've heard something and you've decided, hey, I want to buy this stock. So you go on your computer on E-Trade or whatever and you buy 20 shares of Apple. An algor algorithmic trade is the opposite of that. You're, the computer would make that trade. 
Um, so the first thing it does is it actually eliminates emotion or bias. As individuals were clouded by a lot of preconceived notions, uh, biases that might be unfounded. Um, and by using code to make these decisions, we're not allowing, we're not giving ourselves the opportunity to be subject to that. Uh, the second thing it offers is constant mon monitoring. So as a person, if you're not a day trader, which is someone who spends the entire hit, whose job is to invest in the stock market, uh, you're only going to have um, a certain amount of time to actually look into the stock market and decide what stocks to buy. But if you have an algorithm running constantly, not only are you constantly monitoring it, um, which is enabling the consistency of your strategy, but you're also saving a lot of time because you as a, you don't have to check the market as much to make sure that trades happen. And like, like I mentioned, it's consistent. Um, you're, you're making sure that if parameters are met, if, if any time parameters are met based on your investment strategy, you're buying it. Whereas if the parameters met, but you don't have time to check the stock market, you not, you may not buy it. So you may not uh, ensure the efficacy of your investment strategy as a whole. And lastly, it enables the back testing of strategies and back testing is basically checking the effectiveness of a strategy through the use of historical data. Um, so what that means is in, when, 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 when you make, when, when you think, when you write, when you write an algorithm, um, to trade, you, you oftentimes you're, you're simulating it against the real life, uh, the real life market, but you can think of back testing kind of like test code. So when you write a program, you want to see if the program's working. So you, you have to write some test code and make some numbers up to see if your input, uh, based on your input, you're getting the correct output. So back testing is basically using uh, past year stock trends as your test code in a sense. On your, you're plugging that into your algorithm to see if it's working because it's because it's in the past, you know, if it would actually make a difference or not. So it's a great way to check if your strategy is working or not. And overall reduction of human error due to the reliance on code. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory um, because you know, like I said, we have so many, so many biases that affect us. Um, so our subjectivity can be replaced by the objectivity of code, but it's not in a sense, it's not man versus machine. It's kind of a way that ma how can man best leverage machine to enable the greatest opportunities of success. So that's kind of the benefits of algorithmic trading. Next slide, please. So like I mentioned, there's two main types of algorithms and the ones I was talking, talking about earlier are profit seeking algorithms, specifically strategy driven algorithms. So a profit seeking algorithm, like the name suggests, the goal for the goal for one is to make money. Um, that that's, that's completely the focus. Um, and I'll talk about predatory after I talk about order filling and order filling algorithms. The goal of an order filling algorithm is to buy small portions of a large investment. Um, and that's because you don't want to move the market. So this can often get a bit uh, complicated. So let me, let me, let me make an example that might help you guys put things into perspective. Um, so let's say Emoji um, is actually the CEO of a hedge fund, right? He's in control of a hedge fund and he wants to buy a million shares of Apple stock. And I, and I'm just an individual trader and I want to buy a hundred shares of Apple stock. So if I want to buy a hundred shares of Apple stock, I can go ahead and just buy a hundred shares of Apple stock because that's not going to make much of a difference to the market because the more stock you buy, the higher the stock price increases. But if a mole is to buy a million shares of Apple stock, that's a huge amount in relation to the market cap of Apple. So a mole's decision would move the market in the sense it would increase the stock price, which would increase it for himself. So if a mole wants to buy a million shares of Apple stock, he's not going to buy it all at once because that would just drive the price up for himself. But what a mole could do is write an order filling algorithm that would say, Hey, I want to buy a million shares of Apple. For, I will buy a hundred, I'll buy 50 shares of Apple for the next X, Y, Z amount of days until uh, the order is filled. So what the algorithm does here is basically just carries out a large order over a long, a long time uh, to not move the market. So a predatory algorithm, which is a profit, an example of a profit seeking algorithm is to find algorithms like large, large order filling algorithms. Because um, say I write a, so say a mole's hedge fund wants to buy a credit uh, wants to buy a million shares of Apple and every day they're buying 50 shares of Apple to not give away their investment strategy and at the same time not increase the price for themselves. If my predatory, my predatory algorithms goal is to find um, large orders, like a million, like a million shares of Apple. So my predatory algorithm would detect, Hey, why is there like this consistent increase of Apple, like 50 shares a day by this one? Like there's a consistent increase of purchase in Apple stock per day. 
I've detected that a large order is going on. So I buy a lot of shares of Apple. So what that does for me is that because Amol's, Amol's hedge fund is going to complete the, the million shares of Apple uh, and say he's halfway through and my, my predatory algorithm detects that um, he's making this large order and I buy a lot of Apple stock, then when then as the order continues and the price slowly increase, I would make great profits. So like the name suggests, it's kind of like a predator looking for prey, like looking for these large orders or looking to capitalize of somebody else's investment strategy and just ride that wave. So those are the main, the two main types of algorithms. There's definitely many more. And the VWAP, TWAP, and time slice are three different ways of executing an order filling algorithm based on time, based on volume of the market and, and other kind of complicated things. But those are the main two types of algorithms that people employ and order fillings typically used for larger corporations, whereas profit seeking in specific strategy driven um, algorithms is more, um, more for individuals. And that's more likely what us as teenagers would be likely, likely to employ. Next slide, please. Um, so let's talk about the steps to algo trading. Um, so the first, the first thing you want to do is you want to fo formulate your strategy. So there's no code, no programming involved in this. You want to think as an investor, um, where do I spot, where do I think, how do I think I can make money, right? What am I, what type of companies, what sectors, what, what what's going to make me money? So once you have that sorted out, you can start converting into code. And if you, if you've taken a comp computer science class, the first thing you, before you, before you even start coding your lab or your project, you first think of, you first think of how am I going to do it? So once you kind of, um, identify that, then you can convert it into code. Um, so once you, once you, once you convert it into code, it's not, you're not done. A lot of people would just stop at that step and that's, that's dangerous because there's real money involved. So the third step you do is you back test. Like I mentioned, you use historical data points to test your code to see if it's working. The fourth thing you do is you'd implement risk management, which basically is, um, implementing things that would, that, that would ensure you wouldn't lose a ridiculous amount of money. Um, so if you, if your program crashes, um, if you're, if you're, you're coding a website or coding a, a backend server or whatever, uh, and your program crashes, it's not a big deal, uh, because you can just fix it because it's, it's, there's no money involved. Whereas when you're algo trading, cause money's involved, you want to make sure there's a lot of risk management. So if, uh, if, if Apple stock say tomorrow, absolutely tanks, I want to make sure that I have limits, um, and risk management forms that would, that would sell all my Apple stock before it would become too bad. The fifth thing you want to do is called paper trading, or it's called simulate. It's, it's, it's paper trading, which is simulating with the real life data. It's kind of like back testing, but you're using, you're simulating your algorithm to the market on a daily basis. Um, and, and the beauty of paper trading or simulating with the real life data is that there's no actual money involved. So it's kind of, kind of a way to see how successful your algo is again, but you're not losing any money. And the sixth thing you do is you start trading, you start putting actual money in, but you must guarantee to start slow and then you can scale up because like I say, I'm saying it a lot of times, but it's because um, I want to emphasize the fact that because money is involved, you need to be careful. And throughout the process, you want to test your code like you would with anything and you want to optimize your code. Um, and for those who don't know, optimizing your code is essentially making your code faster. And you could do that by using less memory, using less lines of code. Um, and the goal of opti optimizing your code is to, is to, like I said, to make it go faster, but, but because um, the market is moving, like, because the market moves like a couple of cents every hour, um, it's, it's, it's better to have a faster code that, that, that b would buy before you lose maybe a couple of cents, but over, over time that adds up. Okay. Next slide, please. And lastly, um, I want to talk about some resources for algo trading because oftentimes it seems, uh, it seems like this, this, um, type of, uh, activity or hobby or, or job that a lot of people don't want to get involved in because it's like, uh, seen as very difficult, but it's very simple to get involved. Um, the recommended language for algo trading is Python, but, um, some other, some other platforms do use C plus plus C sharp and Java, but I'm, but I'm, I'm fairly certain that if you know, C plus plus C sharp or Java and don't know Python, it's, it's pretty easy to shift because it's, in, it's just minor syntax differences, but fundamentally they're pretty similar and resources. Uh, when I say resources, I mean, platforms for algorithmic trading are Quantopian, Quant Connect, Quant Rocket. There are a lot, of, there are a lot of great ones in the market, but 
these are the best in my opinion because one they allow for back testing two they're python based and three live trading simulations so essentially they allow you to test your code um right in the platform itself without looking without you trying to get like without you trying to uh get like your own data uh, they already offer that and i i also believe quantopian is also c c based so yeah that's a good option if you don't want to make the switch to python next slide please yeah so great time for any questions uh i noticed we had a question in the chat we we we, we want to really make sure that people have like enough enough time for questions because i know like a lot of the stuff we've covered we went we went relatively fast given the one hour time limit so yeah so definitely if anyone has any questions um yeah and i can answer, answer the question about a route IRA. um so can you could you could you yeah matthew has a question as well are penny stocks worth it okay that's a good question so for those who don't know penny stocks are extremely uh extremely cheap stocks so typically they're like 50 cents 70 cents and they're they're really cheap but the reason they're kind of they're people not not everyone agrees with buying them is because they're extremely risky um so there's two ways to look at penny stocks so the way some people look at it they're like okay it's 50 cents um they might like shoot up shoot up to like a dollar and i can sell my stock uh, but other people say like it's it's risky and it's not just worth the risks so penny stock to answer your question penny stocks are worth it depending on depending on one your financial capacity uh, how much are you willing to risk and then over to your overall um, strategy for investment so if you're looking to go long term penny stocks are definitely not worth it because they're not they're no guarantee of long term gains you're, you're more you're better off looking at low cost mutual funds and mutual funds and uh, index funds that are just much safer so penny, in that sense penny stocks aren't worth it but if you're up for the risk and you and you're willing to sacrifice um about fifty dollars no sorry not fifty dollars like fifty cents i mean it depends how many shares you buy but if you're if you're willing to sacrifice that amount of money um for potentially high good good profit margins then yeah you could say they're worth it um yeah, i think adding on to that um it really depends on the penny stock itself so like we went in the investment slides that josh covered uh you should always look at like the growth of a certain stock you shouldn't just buy it because oh yesterday moved up by like 10 percent, right it's always good to look at a trend line like over five years or something see if that penny stock has been increasing over time so it's always good to do your research beforehand along with the things that Tay just mentioned yeah uh one more thing adding on to that uh penny stocks they're as you can look through the trend line but a lot of it it's a lot more fluctuating and it's a lot more volatile than normal stocks would be because they are penny stocks so with one thing you could do instead if you want to play a risky short-term big gain type of strategy you could go with options instead but as the name says they are optional because they're very risky but it's quite similar it's basically making a bet on whether or not the stock will go up or down in the near future and by how much and with 50 cents you can make like 20 dollars easily if you know how to play the market right but it's once again it's very risky but it's not another choice if you want to go down that path mm -hmm. uh so what about what about roth iras is, is another question um could you elaborate on that i i think given on the timestamp, i think you're referring to like uh, future planning so yeah so Roth IRAs are essentially um, individual retirement accounts, and they're not taxed upon distribution. Um, so essentially what that means is over time, it'll do, um, unless of course you have like a terrible market bust or poor or a lot of negative market um, market fluctuations, uh, you, you'll make a lot of money over time with the Roth IRA. Yeah, okay. So you, you, you can make a lot of money over time, especially for us, um, assuming we're all 16, 17, 18, uh, if you do have the money to put in a Roth IRA, it's definitely beneficial. Um, but then again, it goes to your strategy because a lot of people, a lot of people that will typically like Roth IRAs, you can't take your money out as easily. In the sense, if you're planning on putting your money into a Roth IRA, you should plan to have it in there for a longer time. You don't want to, you don't. It's not something you just take out, take, put in, put in. So if you put it, put in, put back, like it's it's if if you're willing to commit to long term, it's definitely worth it, especially at our age um it's a, it's a good means for retirement as well um i actually know somebody um who, who my my old one of my old teachers told me that when he was 16 he put in um his parents put in a lot of money for a roth ira and i think what he got out when he was like six years old was eight times the value so if you're willing to keep the money in there for a long time definitely worth it 
Um, and it is relatively safe uh, compared compared to stocks. It's definitely safer. Uh, Matthew says, what industries are good to invest in potentially buy stocks in at this current time in near future? That's a good, that's a good question, Matthew. Um, so at this moment, overall, the market is doing well considering there's like definitely COVID-19 stuff going on. Um, but again, then again, it depends one, how much money you're willing to uh, not risk, but invest. And also what your strategy is a whole. But typically a lot of people, what a lot of analysts especially are saying is that tech is a good field to invest in right now. Because especially, especially with the move to remote, remote education, remote, uh, remote working, remote jobs and remote everything practically, like we've had to shift our lives more to the indoor. A lot of tech companies are doing really well. So overall, that's a sector that a lot of people are recommending. Uh, but yeah, then again, like it, it's subjective based on how much you can invest in what your strategy is, but, um, whatever you do, it's important not to invest. Like, even if one industry is doing well, it's important to like, not put all your money just in that in industry. Cause at the end of the day, you want to diversify the industry, the industries you're um, invested in. So you're diversifying your risk. So even if one industry tanks, if you have it in another, um, if you, if you have some, uh, you have stocks in another industry or bonds in another industry, you're protected, uh, because the gains in that could neutralize the losses. So no matter what industry, I mean, like I said, tech, like off the top of my head, that's probably the, the best one right now, doing well right now. But uh, no matter what it is, you should make sure you invest in all or a majority of them. Um, any more questions we would be happy to answer. We can we can definitely like um, maybe go on to the next time, but if we see a question, we'd love to get, we'd love to answer. Yeah, so kind of want to talk more about resources. I know we talked about resources uh, for the FinTech algorithmic trading section, but we want to talk about resources um, from a personal finance perspective. Um, we strongly believe that like everyone should like make the effort. And I know it's like, it seems kind of not daunting, but rather boring um, personal finance because it's, it's an issue that's so far in the future. A lot of us think like we haven't even gone to college. We haven't even started working like why do we need to know this stuff but it's like 70 percent of americans out of, out of out of high school um don't have basic skills to invest i mean not sorry not to invest to to manage their money and that is one of the greatest causes of cyclical poverty and homelessness like i think i will mentioned earlier so we highly recommend you guys like look up some courses we, we can recommend some um we can definitely recommend some. There's a lot of great courses. We work with a lot of content providers as well. So, I mean, naturally, we, we think their courses are great. Um, but, yeah, we, we strongly recommend you guys, like, uh, make the effort to, like, look at some courses online. And a lot of them, yeah, for sure. If you could just drop your email in the chat, we'd be more than happy. Um, we can send you – well, yeah, if, if you guys would like to drop your emails in the chat, we can actually send you the, the slideshow as a whole as well. And we can also send you, like, we're creating – we're actually um, right now in the middle of creating um, a shared Google Drive that would have like templates for budget plans uh, and like balance our, our slides, like balance sheets. Yeah, that's what I meant to say, balance sheets. So like, like kind of like a toolkit for everyone, especially from a high school standpoint. And moving forward, we're also going to be creating something, especially for, um, for students who are looking to pay for college. Because a lot of times people find like financial aid stuff uh, hard to navigate. And also we're creating a newsletter, which um, we're also going to be including like a lot of interesting sections. Like we're going to be interviewing um, pr uh, professionals in the business fields, like from all like, from a mortgage analyst to an entrepreneur. So like even like basically want to cover everyone's experiences. So we really want to give uh, our generation the the opportunity, because I know a lot of people, especially in minority communities and lower socioeconomic neighborhoods don't have this opportunity. So we're trying to bring this to everybody. Um, so definitely if you guys want to drop your email, we can send you all, all, all that you, all that you need. So yeah, for resources, just drop your email, drop your email in the chat. We'll save it and we'll send you an email right after this with access to the slides and the more resources. Oh, oh yeah. A question from Swastik that says, could you elaborate more about predatory investing? Like give more examples as such. Yeah. So there's a lot of examples for predatory investing, but essentially the, the point, the main thing that I was trying to explain with predatory investing is um, everyone should understand that predatory investing is kind of capitalizing of somebody else's investment in a sense. Um, when you understand what someone else is going to do, you, you can use that, to your, use that to your advantage and also invest in that because you know they're going to make a considerable investment. So it's like a predator, like your algo is kind of like a predator. It's trying to hunt for like prey. 
Um, does that answer your question in a sense? Um, I'm not sure. Oh yeah, that's great. That's great. Oh, and we'd be more more than happy to make this recording available to everybody as well. Uh, next slide, please. Oh yeah, I think that that brings us to the end. We'd be more than happy to like hang around for the next five minutes and answer any questions. Uh, but we we do have a feedback form. Uh, just because we we'd love to know, we'd love to hear what you guys think. Uh, we've been doing workshops now for like, uh, six months I believe, and we've been doing it like all over South Korea. We're having our first one in South Korea, France, India. We're having our first one in Zambia, and we'd love to hear what you guys think. Um, so we can make this a, a better experience for everybody involved, and make it uh, more applicable to from a student perspective. But yeah, that pretty much brings us to the end. Thank you, thank you guys so much for coming. Like I mentioned, we'd love to stay around and answer questions. And thank you so much to Bridge Hacks for giving us this opportunity. So thank you guys a lot. Um, yeah, so if you guys have any questions, just drop them now. Thank you. Um, the recording will automatically, like I said, go into like our drive and like the Cisco WebEx um, stuff. So did you want a copy or like, I can like email what you want if you want the link to the um, meeting. Sure, that'd be great, yeah. Okay, yeah, so um, you can just like end the recording then. So like if anyone has questions, it doesn't get recorded. Um, I think Agreem has to do that, but yeah, thank you guys for showing up. Um, for sure. We really appreciate you guys taking the time to do this.